Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. Learning how to weave but need the right shuttle? Hooked on knitting and in search of a lofty yarn? Yarn Barn of Kansas has been your partner in fiber since 1971. Whether you are around the corner from the Yarn Barn of Kansas or around the country, they are truly your local yarn store with an experienced staff to answer all your fiber questions. Visit yarnbarn-ks.com to shop, learn, and explore. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Merrow. Hannah Thyssen Howard is the author of two books on slow knitting and is a yarn industry consultant and co-partner. Well, Hannah, thanks so much for being with me. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I love the Long Thread podcast. Oh, thank you. So I think I want to start by talking about your book slow knitting and seasonal slow knitting. So so two books. And by slow knitting, you don't just mean all of the works in progress that I haven't finished. What does slow knitting mean to you? Right. So the first thing that I that I often get asked is, or what happens a lot is I'll be at a show and someone will come up and they'll pick up the book and they'll look at their friend and they go, oh, it's slow knitting. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not about it's not about the speed, but it is about the speed mm-hmm. in a way. Slow knitting is a reflection of the slow food movement that started in Italy and moved over to California and kind of has changed the landscape of food worldwide by paying attention to ingredients really closely and honoring all those ingredients. And slow knitting is the same sort of movement, but for fiber, for wool. So instead of just walking into any store and picking up whatever's on the shelf, we're asking ourselves deeper questions about where our fibers are coming from and what makes them unique and experimenting with different textures or flavors of wool. But it's also about the experience that you have as a knitter. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. I like to say that they're knitting philosophy books in a lot of ways because they're sort of a book that reflects on my own experience. I've been knitting now for over 20 years, Mm -hmm. which is crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. And when you're knitting that long, you kind of experiment with a lot of different things throughout your whole knitting practice. And it's easy to get sucked into certain habits or patterns of behavior with what we buy, what we make, instead of pushing ourselves outside of that box. So it's a little bit about challenging ourselves again, but it's also about rediscovering the simple joy of of when we first started, that wonder feeling that we experience when we try a wool that we fall in love with for the first time, or we finish a project that we're really excited about. So it's about reclaiming the joy, letting go of, um, I guess, the fear of missing out in a lot of ways, using what we have and honoring where it comes from. It seems like this is very much a celebration of the process versus the product kind of knitting. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there's always that debate. Are you a product knitter? Are you a process knitter? I'm definitely both. You know, I love every aspect of of making and creating something from beginning to end. And then I love using it after I've made it and just knowing more about my materials and where they come from and thinking more about the process as I'm creating has um, added a whole nother richness, a layer of richness to my process. And I noticed one thing that you've, you've said a couple of times, you've, you've talked about wool as opposed to yarn. And once upon a time, those things were totally synonymous. And I think over time, we've kind of drifted away from that. What is the wool yarn connection for you? Yeah. So I think I enjoy a lot of different fibers. I mean, I have it all Mm -hmm. in my stash, the alpaca and the cashmere. But I just feel like there's endless variety when it comes to wool. So for me, it's like this key ingredient that is synonymous with my making process. It's 
you know, the flower <laughs> of the fiber world. You can take it and you can make anything with it. You can make, um, you know, a delicious cake or bread, or you could turn it into a roux, a sauce that goes over something. So it's just endlessly variable and versatile. And so I focus a lot on wool and specifically heritage wool breeds, seeking out unusual textures that I can play with that create new feelings and materials that I get to wear and work with. So So one of the things I've noticed that you've been involved in lately is your fiber shed. Can you tell me about your fiber shed? Yes, sort of. (laughs) (laughs) I can sort of tell you about it. So my involvement with fiber shed is relatively new. I have been following the fiber shed movement uh, started by Rebecca Burgess out of California for some time and really enjoy the messaging and the mission of fiber shed as a whole, which is to connect and identify supply chains that are local to people who want to use them. So fiber shed is a network that is international and each affiliate, each fiber shed affiliate is located in their specific region or range, usually united by some zeitgeist of similarity, either culturally or perhaps like they're all growing the same type of thing, or they have a physical watershed or region and unique biosphere that they are working around. So all the fiber shed affiliates are different throughout the country. And I have just restarted the Fiber Shed affiliate for Kentucky and Tennessee with the help of my friend Robin Versan from Hill and Hollow Farm. And we decided to combine, previously it had just been parts of Kentucky and parts of Tennessee, kind of the central area. And it was called, I believe, the Southern Appalachia Fiber Shed, maybe the Central Appalachia Fiber Shed. I'm not sure. It was very confusing because there were like three with the name Appalachia. (laughs) (laughs) And unfortunately, the woman who was in charge of that fiber shed had to drop out for personal reasons. And at the time, she was really the anchor for the area here. And after, I think it was a year or two years of not, not being able to run it, some of us in the region started, I guess, sort of grumbling to each other, like, we wish there was something for us here. And I have been working in the wool industry for a long time, and I've had the blessing to work with lots and lots of different people. And over the past two years, I have been working very closely with the Hudson Valley Textile Project, which is a non-Fiber Shed affiliate. They're not affiliated with Fiber Shed out of New York. And they have a very similar mission to highlight Hudson Valley-based fiber makers. And then through that, the Fiber Shed in New York and also with a few mills. So being able to work in that space and see how the Fiber Shed in New York has done an amazing amount of work to do things for their region. They are building a scouring facility. Well, they've already built it. It's running. Clean Fleece, New York. And they are researching pelletizing, which is something that's very exciting and upcoming in the industry for the use of what would other otherwise be useless fiber. It's compostable fiber being reused for fertilizer. And so there's all these interesting projects happening and they're really rejuvenating and working hard to build a network that the farmers and ranchers, but also all of the makers can get involved and be proud of. And I really was beginning to crave that here. I've told many people throughout throughout my career that even though I'm born in the South, have lived in the South, most of Southeast U.S. for most of my life. I'm a New England girl at heart (laughs) because I love going up to New England and I love the community feeling of the Northeast. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know, you have to kind of like bloom where you're planted and build a table if you don't find a seat at one. And even though the New England and Northeastern associations have been so welcoming and kind and given me an abundance of information. I don't live there and I'm not able to get my hands on at farms there except a few times a year if I plan a visit. And I want to be with wool people as much as possible. So I started talking to some people who had previously been in the network and the, the one that had dissolved. And we worked to reform the Greater Cumberland Fiber Shed, which is our newly renamed Fiber Shed, and it incorporates Tennessee and Kentucky. And that is a huge Fiber Shed range, but we chose it because both of these states have a very similar 
kind of like cultural roots in innovation and scrappiness and we get each other. So we thought it'd work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one doesn't necessarily think of the Southeast when you think about fiber, which I think is a very sort of limited idea of the world. So can you tell me what it is like to be looking around for fibers near you and what you're finding? Yeah, so that's always been a huge challenge for me living in the South. I felt like I was very distant from the really fiber centers in the U.S. And as I've begun working on redeveloping this fiber shed with the help of other farmers and designers in the area who may be a little more tuned in than I have been, I am discovering there's so much fiber here. People just don't know where to send it, what to do with it. They don't know who wants it. So we have a lot of dual breed sheep here. There's a lot of polypay, which is an American breed that is not all that common. It, it is getting more and more attention lately and people are interested in polypay, but it's hard to find. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have a lot of it. They just aren't sending it to become wool anywhere. They're just using them as meat breed sheep. So I think one of our biggest biggest goals for the fiber shed is going to be to help connect our farmers to other potential places they can sell their wool or get the wool processed. We've also got a lot of land down here that can be used. Sheep and goats love like rocky terrain and we've got <laughs> a lot of rocky terrain. So it's really surprising that we don't have more sheep being bred, but I've encountered now baby doll South Downs and Dorsets. We've got polypay. We've got a ton of Katahdin, which really? is really unusual. Mm -hmm. Gulf Coast native, which is out of Florida and Georgia. And some people are raising that here. Some Jacobs and Shetlands, just all kinds of interesting sheep that you wouldn't know. And lots, lots of alpaca. We have a ton of alpaca in our region. So I actually just had a meeting with SEXPA, the Southeastern Kentucky Sheep Producers Association. Wow. And they were in the midst of forming their own wool and fiber chapter. So we're going to group with them and help them work on some really interesting projects, including some that are rejuvenating land that has been strip mined, which is really fascinating and not something I would have known about doing. So I'm really using the network sponsors, collective Peter's knowledge Valley and School just being a connector, which is something the learning, I, I think I do pretty well. And practice of fine craft. For more than 50 years, accomplished artists and students have come together in community for powerful creativity and joyous lifelong learning in beautiful Northwestern New Jersey. We are firmly dedicated to inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. We value and welcome the experienced professional artist, the new learner, the collector, and everyone in between to be touched by the power of craft. Visit petersvalley.org to start your journey today. And now back to the show. You know, I've suddenly been seeing polypay everywhere. It was something that I had only heard of once before when talking about the Idaho sheep station where it was developed. But now I feel like all of a sudden I'm I'm hearing about polypay all over the place. It's sort of a sparking up everywhere. Yeah, you heard it here first, folks. Polypay is <laughs> the hot new wool breed for the Absolutely. year. Absolutely. And maybe we'll get some Monadale on there too. Yes, yes, that's true. Which is, I think, another American breed. It is, it is. Yeah. And there's a lot of it in the Northeast. And the other thing that I think of the maybe a little bit farther south, but there are some plant fibers in your region as well. Is that something that's also going on in your fiber shed? So not so much in, in our fiber shed, but some neighboring ones have really, really gone deep on that. One that is notable is the Louisiana fiber shed. They're doing a ton with cotton. And it's very, very fascinating what they've been doing with cotton. I actually heard recently that they've purchased a couple cotton gins and they're processing cotton now. So yeah, I really, really am looking forward to um, using the slight privileges that come with being president of current setting president of a fiber shed is that you get to connect with all the other fiber sheds. So I've already been in contact with the folks in Virginia and North Carolina and up in West Virginia about some larger scale projects that we might all be interested in in doing. Because as you said, the Southeast is historically pretty ignored as a, as a sheep raising area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So one of the challenges of the fiber shed movement overall is not only the growing, but the production. And so can you tell me kind of what you've learned about working with Battenkill and the, the folks associated with processing that connects to what you're doing with the fiber shed? Yeah, absolutely. So working with Battenkill Fiber Mill, which was over the last two years, is has been an incredibly eye-opening experience, not only to their process for making wool, but also the national process for wool processing. It's a lot of me saying processing <laughs> in a row. It's important. Process uh, is important. <laughs> yes. So right now in the U.S., it's my understanding that we have a lot of wool and not a lot of places to send it. The first step in wool processing is scouring, scouring and sorting. And there are only a few scouring facilities. There's one on the West Coast, I believe that's fairly large. And then down here, we've got Chargers, which is out of the Carolinas. And they're very large too. And then up in the Northeast, they have just opened this new scouring facility that's a mid-sized scouring facility. But until then, there were really only the small mills processing orders from 10 pounds to 50 to 100, 150 pounds. And then if you have the volume, 500 pounds plus, you can send to a bigger facility to get scoured and processed. Well, everyone who's in between is just you know, not sure what to do. So they've been sending to their mills and the mills are backed up. You know, they're processing all this scouring. How they solved this in the Hudson Valley is that they invested in building their own scouring facility. And now that scouring facility is serving their region and the larger region. What would be great would be having, you know, four or five of these throughout the U.S. So potentially something like that coming into the Southeast would be great. We do have chargers here, so I would love, hey, chargers, if you're listening, (laughs) I would love to partner with you to open something smaller since y'all know what you're doing and I don't. (laughs) Yeah, so something, something like that down here would be great. I think that elements that I really have learned about the processing end of things are just how much knowledge goes into the individual fiber types. So it's not as simple as just like toss it in the wash, take it out. (laughs) You know, not everything gets washed on warm. So you have to wash certain fibers with higher heat and more soap and other fibers with lower heat and less soap. And some fibers are very dusty, dirty. So they're going to have a lot of sediment and other fibers are greasy, dirty. So they're going to have to have lanolin that you cut through. And this knowledge is learned by people who are doing it. So the best way to figure out how to do it is just to start doing it and learn under someone else. And we have a lot of farmers who are very knowledgeable about maybe washing their own wool, but it's very different, you know, can of worms to open up a whole facility and wash a lot of people's wool for them and have all that information. So I think the biggest thing has been learning what I don't know has been the biggest challenge. And there's so much I don't know. I'm still learning all the time. But, you know, dipping my toes in by spending that time with Battenkill and learning from Mary Jean Packer and the team over there has been majorly beneficial and has really connected, I guess, plugged me into what the industry is doing on the scale that I want to be involved. You know, I've worked with much larger mills internationally. So I'm very used to that process, which feels a bit like ordering your wool from a department store. Mm, (laughs) And, and then I've, you know, now worked on this completely other end where everything is bespoke, essentially coming in and out of the mill. And one of the projects that you worked on for the Hudson Valley textile project was sort of shining a spotlight onto that community. Can you tell me about Common Thread? Yes. So Common Thread's is a little brainchild of mine and the help of the Hudson Valley Textile Project. We brought it to life last year as a little proof of concept newspaper. The idea behind Common Threads is to showcase all of the interesting pieces of the fiber supply chain and show them in use, essentially. So the publication is kind of a knitting, I guess, sort of a knitting newspaper, but not really. It has a knitting pattern in it, has some other recommended knitting patterns, but really it talks a lot about 
yarn and fiber production. It showcases designers, fashion designers, work that is using elements in the fiber supply chain. The Hudson Valley Textile Project is an organization that really brings together all stages of production. So you have people who are big New York fashion designers, you've got sweater manufacturers, and then you've got all the way down to people just have a handful of sheep on their farm. And so getting those people connected and also putting them all in a showcase together kind of highlights the full range of what this network is able to do and shows it in a way through the newspaper that feels very tangible and accessible. Every element of this publication has been extremely detailed and thought out. So every garment presented, every yarn used, every photo set, the locations, the models, the paper that we printed on, where we printed, everything was very, very carefully sourced to make it as local and relevant to the mission as possible. You know, it's interesting that printing on newsprint, I felt like was such a statement because paper is a textile. And so what decisions you're making about your paper, I just thought that that was really fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys chose, you know, what you did and what you thought it sort of said about your project? Yeah. So first and foremost, we chose newsprint because it's inexpensive. It's an inexpensive medium and it's also fully recyclable. And often by the time that you get newsprint, it's already been recycled. It's one of the lowest impact fibers, you know, cotton, cotton papers available. And I believe that they even make, make some of it here domestically. So newsprint's very easy for all printers to get a hold of. But it also keeps the cost of the finished finished book very low. And we wanted to not compete in the same range as some of the glossier magazines that are available on the newsstand or at your yarn store. We wanted it to feel very grassroots and homegrown, like something that you would find at, you know, when you go to a small town and they have all the local publications sitting on the the counter at the general store or whatever. We wanted to have that feel. And I think what's kind of cool about it is, I know you mentioned it's a proof of concept, but it to me, it has sort of a fresh feeling to it. It's like, you know, you get your newspaper every day and it means that this is something that's new and, you know, hopefully is something that will continue coming. Yes. Yeah. I'd love to do another one. I don't know when we'll do another one, Mm -hmm. but it was so much fun to put it together and really do a publication with all the elements that I've been knocking around in my head for a while. This is not the first publication that you have put together. You have worked on something called By Hand Serial. Can you tell me about that? Yes, yes. Okay, so my publication work actually goes back even further Mm -hmm. than By Hand Serial. I got my start working on pattern collections and publications very early in my career. I was working for Malabrigo Yarns. And I did an internship with them and I was able to help style and choose location for Malabrigo book three, which was an interesting book in that the patterns, basically Malabrigo had gone to a bunch of designers and said, make whatever you want using whatever color you want. (laughs) And so nothing, (laughs) nothing matched in the whole. And so my job as the stylist was to make it look cohesive. So that was the first kind of taste taste out of fashion school that I got of doing that. And I fell in love with the finished product, making that finished product. So I got to completely design, creative direct, edit, and style Malabrigo book four after that. And that's really when it began, when I was sort of like, I know that I want to do more in publishing. And I didn't have another opportunity for a while, but then I was hired by by Hand Serial, which was a very small independent publication out of Oregon run by Andrea Hungerford. And Andrea was going on trips with a photographer and interviewing notable knitting and making personalities in different areas of the country and eventually the world. And the goal was to highlight these making communities, areas that were almost incubator zones for highly creative people. And so she did several of these and I came on around book two, which was Portland and Midcoast, Maine. And she and I got to travel together quite a bit. And over time, I went from being 
the social media girl to being the production editor and getting to really have a hand in constructing the itinerary for issues, but also figuring out the visual look and the styling for the photography and kind of the overall feel of the issue, as well as the marketing campaign. So that was a a really fun project that allowed me to sort of touch a lot of different pieces of the publishing and then have it on a cycle that was, I think we published three times a year. So there was just this continual, something else is coming next. We need to finish and do honor to what we've just done. And I love the movement of that. It's very different than writing a book, which takes like a year (laughs) to write. And then you wait a year (laughs) to get anything back. (laughs) So you mentioned out of fashion school, I was going to ask you if you started as a journalist, but it sounds like you found your way into journalism. Oh, my God. I am the worst student, let me just say. (laughs) So when I say that I went to school somewhere, I mean, I failed upward. (laughs) So I started actually as a painter. Hmm. I'm a fine arts painter, first and foremost, and I do landscapes and painted in acrylic for a long time, went to college for fine arts painting. I just love color and painting for me is taking physical color and doing whatever you want with it, you know? And so I really fell in love with the process of playing with color. And I had been knitting for a long time and I was playing with color through my knitting as well. And I had been knitting and, and just felt like there was no, this was maybe like 2008. I just didn't feel like the economy was looking great for me to come out of school and be a professional artist. <laughs> so yes. I said, maybe I should switch gears and do something, you know, art adjacent that I might enjoy. And I had always had a great love of sewing and textiles. And um, I had the knitting background. So I thought, oh, I'll transfer. I'll do fashion design. And I got into the fashion design program and I was failing, failing everything, failing miserably. And part of the reason was I lived in Iowa and it was very cold and I didn't want to walk to class. (laughs) (laughs) So I would stay in and I would knit and my roommate would watch Gilmore Girls on DVD and I would just not, I would just not go to class. I would go on Ravelry and all these other things. So that's kind of like how I ended up coming to knitting was that I, my professor said, you have to have an internship over the summer. And I knew that I was not going to come back the next fall. But I decided to go ahead and use the outreach of the college to set myself up with an internship. And Malabrigo agreed to host me. And so I flew down there and then I just never went back to school. So I have no degree. I have no formal, I guess I've got some formal training in fine art and some formal training in pattern design. And that's, you know, got about two years of each and no degree in either and just kind of been winging it since (laughs) 09. So you've been finding your own way through publication and the knitting and textile world, sort of charting your own path. Yes, yes. And it's been a crazy, crazy winding path. You know, in between the publications, I was working freelance for small, small yarn companies, doing everything from copywriting to product design. I was able to work for two of the largest yarn subscription companies. I was the founding team for Yarnbox and then the revival team for Knit Crate, both of which are sadly gone. And I I don't know, I just, I'm never someone to say no to a new challenge. And so I think along the way when someone would say, do you know anything about manufacturing wool in Peru? I would say, no, but I can figure it out. <laughs> I can ask someone. I'll uh, I'll ask around, see what anyone knows. And it, it just kind of snowballed. So did you start off as a knitwear designer then? No, more of a copywriter. I would say more than anything, I did a lot of copywriting early on. I am not a very good designer. I have done some design partially out of necessity. You know, you're working at a yarn company and they need an extra hat or scarf or whatever for a collection. They'll be like, can you do it? Can you just knit one up? And so some of my, some of my patterns are like that. I did write all of the patterns for seasonal slow knitting, which was a labor of love. And I probably will never do it again because it was just so many patterns. (laughs) 
many patterns. And I'm just not that technical. You know, as I said before, I'm not the best student. And I think to be a really good designer now, you kind of have to learn how to be technically proficient and take that time to, you know, earn the knowledge that creates good, excellent pattern writing. And I'm just not there. So I don't put myself forward as a pattern designer, although I do have some pieces out and I'm proud of them. I would say primarily I'm a a writer and a visual collector. (laughs) Uh, So that actually kind of segues into, you know, back to slow knitting. You know, we talked about the movement, but can you tell me what the difference is between the slow knitting book and seasonal slow knitting? I mean, obviously one of them is about seasons, but uh, what made you decide that was fun? I'm going to do another one. Well, I knew I wanted to do another one as soon as I was finished with the first one. I didn't know what I would want it to be, but I don't think there's anything I enjoy as much as writing and releasing books. They are the most perfect culmination of an idea for me. I can sit down and I can come up with the idea and outline all of the elements and then make them look exact. I'm a very, very hands-on author. And I would say that um, I'm almost an editor of the books that at this point, because I art direct them, I hire everybody who's involved, and then turn it in, you know, and the publisher does the actual editing and the layout and the printing and the publicity. But I really do everything up until that point, I'm trying to deliver as complete a project as possible, because I want to touch every element. So after the first book, I knew I knew I wanted to do a second one. It was only a matter of time. I chose seasonal slow knitting as the second book because I have long felt that the common knitting knowledge that I have encountered was communicating to me that I needed to be the same kind of knitter year round. I think there's a lot of, or at least when I was kind of coming up in the knitting world, it felt like there were a lot of knitters who were very established and they were making sweaters. They were making sweaters year round. They were making socks year round. They were knitting all the time at high, high volume of output. And I've never been very productive as a knitter. I have more whips than finished objects. I get distracted very easily by a new yarn. If swatching could be, could be the craft, I would be really good at that. (laughs) (laughs) Just like experimenting and swatching. I'm not a knitter. I'm a swatcher. That's so funny. That's the part that so many people dread. I know. I wish I could swatch for other people because I (laughs) I love it. It's my favorite part. Uh, I would even skip the winding of the yarn if I could. I would just have people wind me cakes and then I would swatch them all day. Hey, if anyone (laughs) wants me to swatch your yarn, (laughs) let me know. Uh, Yeah, no, I we've gone on such a, a tangent. But yeah, so there was this idea that There was no seasonality at all to the knitting practice. And you're either a knitter with capital K who's knitting all year long, or you're kind of an in and out seasonal knitter. And maybe part of this came from working in a yarn store because it can feel like you don't see people for whole months of the summer unless they're super serious knitter and they're in in there all the time. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't, when I started knitting, I felt, very much in line with that. I was like, oh yeah, I just want to knit all the time. But the longer I've done it, the more distance I've become from necessarily feeling like the knitting is the knitting, right? So people who are knitting are always thinking about knitting. Even if you're not physically knitting, you're going to be thinking about knitting. If you're a, you know, a knitter at heart, you're going to be looking around and going, oh, that would be an interesting sweater texture. Ooh, I wish I had that color in a yarn. Or I wonder how I could get the look of the leaves coming through the trees to be a lace pattern. And you're thinking about it all the time, even if you can't physically be doing it. And here in Tennessee, and I think for a lot of people across, across the United States, we have some hot summers, hot, yes. hot, hot. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be handling wool, even with air conditioning. I don't want to be handling wool all the time. And I know that I could switch to, you know, a silk yarn or a linen yarn or whatever. But maybe what my heart wants me to do is be outside, you know, planting in a garden or be, you know, exploring some other thing than knitting, quilting maybe or sewing or And I just wanted to kind of give myself permission to say, okay, yeah, I might not be physically knitting 
year round, but I am thinking about knitting year round. And there is an attitude of, of knitting that comes into how I interact with the world. And so that's kind of what seasonal slow knitting is about at a very high level. And then at a very, you know, basic level, it is a walk, a knitter's walk through the full year talking about how we can relate to our craft with the season as a backdrop, you know, how it impacts how we feel while crafting. You know, I think one of the things that you're getting at is the way that knitting kind of becomes part of you and it becomes part of who you are and what you are. So that being a knitter is something that you are even when you don't have needles in your hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a personality. It's a lifestyle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of what you're talking about is also that, you know, being in the world of wool and fibers and being part of that community is also something that you are and think about, not just when you are at the yarn store, but just as part of your daily understanding of the world. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that for me, the practice of making has become a holistic pursuit. It's become my life and who I am. And I don't think I'm alone in that. And I don't think that I have, you have to be in the industry as a professional to have that deep connection to fiber. So one of the things about your books is that, you know, we've talked somewhat about the philosophy and sort of the understanding and lifestyle, but one of the most important elements of it is opening it up and seeing the photographs and really finding yourself in the world, wanting to jump into the pages. Do you think that the photography part comes from your fine art background or is that something that you've explored separately? I think it's definitely related to fine art stuff. I was very lucky to attend a school that had a very heavy focus on master painting work. And so I've looked at a lot of the Dutch masters, you know, Renaissance paintings as part of my study. And I love art history And so I've become really kind of had a lifelong obsession with two things, very vivid landscapes and then very involved still lives. I love those Dutch master feast paintings where they've got like the grapes and the lobster and the squash (laughs) and the cat and, you know, everything's (laughs) all over the table and there's like 50 goblets. No one's going to eat it, but it's gorgeous. And the color is so rich and deep and it glows. It has that chiaroscuro from the background, the glowing in the darkness. And so when, when I did slow knitting, I knew that I wanted that look. I wanted a feast for the eyes. I wanted a, a richness, a visual richness that was very communicative of the feelings that I get when when I'm digging through my stash, when I discover a yarn, when I'm getting ready to cast on or swatch. And so I worked to find a photographer that could do that with me for the books. And that was Katie Starks. And Katie is a food photographer originally a food and prop photographer. And I found that food photographers make the best yarn photographers. So by working with Katie and then also working with uh, Jen Bacos for the by hand serial photography, which is also uh, very lush and a lot of visual richness, I have come to kind of isolate what I would consider my look, which is a very colorful, deep, um, moody sort of visual representation. And, and that's in both slow knitting, seasonal slow knitting, but it's kind of translated to everything, everything that I'm doing. And now I take a lot of my own photos for my blog or my Instagram. I don't know if I'd be brave enough to photo a whole book yet (laughs) myself, (laughs) but maybe. So in learning about all this photography, I actually started doing my own little project on the side that I guess I could kind of announce here. So something I've noticed is that we don't have within the industry, if you need stock photos and speaking to as like an editor, of course, going to like stockphoto.com or Unsplash or wherever the stock photos are, even if you're paying for stock photos, there really aren't that many accurate or visually interesting stock photos of crafts. It's always like the same style of image 
usually just someone with like a big bulky yarn and big bulky needles and their hands are knitting, maybe not correctly. Maybe the yarn is facing the wrong way. <laughs> I was going to say, sometimes they're hilarious. Yeah, and sometimes it's... they're really bad. It's it's giving it's giving Lady Eve eating salad, you know? Yes. <laughs> and, and smiling and eating salad. So there's a lot of that out there. And as I've gotten more confident with my photography, I've had a few brands approach me about doing photography for them. And those projects have been really fun for me. So something I've been kind of working on to launch this year, and hopefully by the end of February, will be a stock photo library slash, you know, subscription slash store. So you can purchase individual images, sets of images, or a subscription to ongoing image releases. And my hope is that I can kind of fill that gap of images that are accurate (laughs) and look nice and also show off kind of the full range of crafting and crafter diversity that we have. Often those images are all kind of the same, same picture, same person. We don't have a lot of representation of all of the people who are actually crafting. And so I, I want to, begin to offer offer that so that people can see how our industry really looks and what we're making really feels like and looks like and make it easier for people who are trying to do one thing, let's say writing amazing content from having to also be a professional photographer or if they're a farmer and they're raising really great wool, why should they also have to be on Instagram and being, you know, their own photographer and doing this and doing that. I just think we're asking so much of so many people in the world right now. So if this is somewhere I can kind of alleviate, alleviate work for someone, it would be fun. And images are so important right now. I mean, I think there's a whole variety of different websites and social media platforms, et cetera, but images, having high quality images is so key that being able to present something that's attractive and says what you need to say is, as you say, kind of the last hurdle for some otherwise successful companies. Yes, absolutely. And and my hope is that over time, it won't just be my photography on this site. I'm hoping to bring in guest photographers. I'm hoping to bring in guest illustrators. Hmm. I think that it would be really fun to have some more illustration and visual art forms to choose from to, you know, give, give round visuals for articles or materials, or it would just be great to have more images of crafting out there in the world. (laughs) And not, you know, yarn as spaghetti that you're, (laughs) that you're eating with. (laughs) I don't (laughs) even know. Some of the images in these stock photos, I mean, how many times have you seen a shawl put on backward or, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, a hat inside out? Socks on feet that don't fit them. <laughs> Fabric that's clearly crocheted, but there's a knitting needle stuck in it. Uh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. many. <laughs> so many. So many. So what's the most exciting knitterly or fiberly thing that you have come across recently? Oh, gosh. You know, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I'm in a little bit of a slump right now. I can't seem to finish or start or stick with anything. I'm getting very excited about my own stash recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have built this beautiful selection of yarns over the course of my career. And I really haven't had that much time to dive into it and start, you know, digging through and knitting things that I've been thinking about for a long time. So right now what's exciting me is my own, my own stash. Can I say that? Is that allowed? I think that is wonderful. I think that that is amazing because, you know, part of if you're very careful about selecting what you buy and what you use, part of it is, boy, I really loved this for a reason. Yeah, I can never catch up to to everything that I bring home. And I did a no buy last year. I did Ooh. a no, I did a cold sheep and did really well with it. Only bought some things around my birthday, but I just kept coming home and looking. I just look at the yarn that I have and I go, oh, I really want to make something with that. Oh, I really want to start something with that. And that feeling is what I have been chasing for such a long time. That's part of why I wrote Slow Knitting and why I wrote Seasonal Slow Knitting is I wanted to communicate 
to myself and also to other people that if you, like you said, if you collect things that are very meaningful to you and, and that you're excited about that, that excitement just never really wanes for me. I can be digging through a bin and find something I haven't seen in a few years and go, Oh, I remember when I bought this and now I need to cast something on. (laughs) (laughs) Now I need to knit a swatch. Yes. And I have some of the you know, farm raised cashmere that I bought at the very first wool festival I ever went to probably 25 years ago, 20 years ago anyway. And I'm excited about that. But boy, if I don't think about it, I bring home more lovely farm raised cashmere, which, you know, that's a, that's a, I'm excited about that too. (laughs) I do talk a lot in my work about how we have patterns, you know, patterns of behavior, patterns of color. And you can kind of see how how you're feeling, what's influencing you over time. A stash is a great visual record of who we are as crafters and who we've become as crafters. There are things that I purchased very early, early on in my practice that I still have, like you said, that I sometimes I look at them like, I don't know what to do with you. But then other days I dig it out and I'm like, oh, wow, that blue color. It's so good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, maybe that's why I have trouble letting go of some things that I would never pick up now. But I still have trouble saying, okay, I don't really want this anymore. Maybe that's why that it's, you know, kind of a record of who I was then. And emotional storage. I teach a class called... It's called something de-stashing. I can't remember what the class name is, but it's about de-stashing. And one of the things that I talk about is that often we buy yarn for a lot of reasons, right? And this can be extended to anything, you know, quilting fabrics, sewing fabrics. We buy yarn for a lot more reasons than just like I need some yarn. And sometimes what we're doing is we're storing, storing emotions that we can't process, you know? And shopping for a lot of people is a form of therapy. And so if you've got something that you're processing and you buy yarn, you're transferring, in my in my thoughts, you're transferring some of that emotion that you can't handle into the yarn. And maybe when you bought it, it gave you a little bit of cheer and it made you feel better about what was happening. And then you put it away in your stash for 10 years and you forget about it. And 10 years when you dig it out, you see it and you go, I bought this, you know, during a really hard time in my life. And it's not, you know, not colors that I want to make with anymore. And I always tell people like, let go, don't, don't be afraid to let go, right? Donate it, give it away. Because that's emotional baggage. At that point, you're just carrying around that emotional baggage attached to that skein that you bought when you were feeling really bad. And now you don't feel bad anymore. And you, you don't like the colors like, let it go. And it, it feels so good to rehome some of those things that you don't even realize you have that tie to. That's true. I do find, though, that some, in some ways, like if you can throw something in a dye pot, mm. that the act of transformation can really change that. And it, actually, sometimes I throw something in a dye pot and then I give it away. <laughs> it's like, yes. I have, you know, it has gone through a step and now I am one step removed from where I was when I bought it and I can let it move on. Exactly. Exactly the same. You know, we've talked about how knitting can just be this really kind of all-consuming part of your life. What are you working on that is not knitting photos and and your yarn stash? What what else are you exploring? Well, I'm every year I explore being a terrible gardener. <laughs> my mother is an exceptional gardener and I do quite well with house plants, but my my home garden is just always out of control. So every time spring rolls around, I I make another attempt for four months to to wrangle it before the weeds take over. So that's that's always very high on my list this time of year. I've also started I took a long break from painting over. Gosh, I would say over the last like 10, 10 years, I really haven't painted much. And so I've been sort of relearning, teaching myself watercolor. So I've been doing a lot of little watercolor paintings and enjoying the simplest form of painting, which is just like, you know, the pigment suspended on a page and and seeing how it comes out. And so that's been really enjoyable. And then spinning. Spinning is always really high on my list. And this year, I'm working my way through two alpaca fleeces, which it's a lot more 
spinning than you would think that it is. It's, it's so much spinning. They're big. <laughs> <laughs> They're so much bigger than they look. You know, they come in a bag and you wash them and wash them and wash them. There's so much washing. Oh, my mm -hmm. goodness. And then I'm finally at the place where I'm carting them and I'm hand carting them. Oh, yeah. Which is taking forever. And I'm making roll eggs, which is taking forever. And then I'm spinning it and it is coming out beautiful. Mm hmm. But because I've done everything by hand, it's really better spun outside because it does still have a little bit of veg in it and dust that goes everywhere. So I'm looking forward to having a little bit warmer weather so I can get back to that spinning project. But spinning and a little bit of cross stitch lately. Picked up yeah. some cross stitch. <laughs> I have a list a mile long. It's so funny that you're doing spinning and we, we've talked all this time and it hasn't come up. Do you find that your spinning is kind of integrated with your work in knitting in the industry or is it sort of a private pursuit? Oh, no. Everything I do has become integrated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I am wool adjacent and that is who I am. I started spinning, I guess, 15, 15 years ago to try and learn more about wool breeds because through spinning, you can really find a lot more textures than you can through yarn, especially 15 years ago. It was like the yarn just wasn't being made. So if you wanted to try an unusual wool, you had to start spinning it. And I've never really been the type of spinner who worked from fleece to finish at any point. I didn't learn that way. I learned on top. So I joined spinning clubs that had a lot of variety at first to try and touch as many different wools as possible. And then I really discovered how fun it is to construct your own yarn from scratch. Spinning for me is the most base level way to interact with a fiber and really learn its personality. Mm -hmm. And I will tell anyone who is interested in learning something deeper about wool, becoming more acquainted with different wool breeds, learn to spin. It's not that hard to learn. It does take some time. It's easier if you have someone helping you. Learn to spin because it puts you hands-on, eye-to-eye with what different fibers do. And you can begin to tell the difference just by touching things. Our sense of touch is so keen. And we just forget how absolutely knowledgeable our fingertips can become. And now I feel like I can touch, I can touch fiber and know what breed it is. I can feel... You know, I can look at a fleece and make a good educated guess. And I would never have been able to do that without spinning. So I feel like it's really become the root of everything else that I do. And I've I'm working on picking up weaving. I have a little loom, but it's not, nothing has influenced all my other fiber practice the way that spinning has. I found sure. that too. I mean, I, I do knit, but I am a spinner, you know, and I think while we're still hopefully building up the manufacturing and processing, et cetera, resources for small farms and small flocks, being a spinner was basically the only way that you could get your hands on a small amount of wool. I mean, even a small mill can't necessarily process, you know, if they can process a single fleece into not top, but into roving, they probably can't process it into yarn. So if you really want to get up close, it's not only the fact that the spinning itself is getting you close to the fiber, it's that it's the closest you can get to the farm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's the best way to support a farmer because spinners will pay more per pound of fleece than any mill or any wool broker. So if you really want to support your local fiber scene, attending fiber shows, learning how to identify, and it's, you know, it's its own, it's a whole nother thing to, to, for people to start doing, but right. learning how to identify if a fleece is interesting to you or not, if you feel that it's a good a good fleece and that you want to spin it. For me, that's the final final frontier, I guess, in a lot of ways, is learning all this stuff. And working with Bat and Kill had been amazing for that. And my goal with the fiber shed is to just continue. I would love to take like a wool grading class. I don't think I would make much of a shearer, but I would love to take a... I would just apologize a lot if I was a shearer. <laughs> Well, Stephanie Wilkes is the the shearer that I, you know, she wrote a book called Raw Materials, and she mm -hmm. does not make it sound like something the average person. I mean, she, it's, it's funny because in some ways she's, she backed into it, but she also gives you the impression this is going to be an act of physical dedication. 
Yes. I have some friends who've taken sharing school and they mm-hmm. all, you know, none of them are wimpy people and they get into the sharing school and they're like, did you know you have to throw around a 200 (laughs) pound sheep? You know, these are big animals. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I was reading a statistic the other day that said the smallest, smallest fleeces from a Shetland might be two to four pounds. And Mm -hmm. then for a Merino or, you know, a larger sheep Cormo or whatever, it could be 40 plus pounds. And that is just, enormous that's Mm -hmm. an enormous fleece yeah 40 pounds is probably several years growth and the sheep is probably really glad to get rid of it (laughs) it might have been shrek it might have been shrek Shrek the marine i think so and yeah it's just amazing the the other thing that you get to do if you spin is you might get to meet the source of your fiber even when yarn is traceable back to a farm, it's pretty hard to trace it back to the individual sheep. And that's kind of a nice connection, you know, like I'm spinning Blossom or I'm spinning Mary Jane. (laughs) It's just sort of a a hands-on, hand-to-hand connection that you don't necessarily get otherwise. Yeah. Any any excuse to meet a sheep, touch a sheep, hide a sheep in my coat, smuggle at home, (laughs) any, any opportunity that I can have to spend more time around sheep and sheep people is yeah. is always something I love doing. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I can't wait to see what you come up with next. I'm looking forward to seeing what images you put together to share with us. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you Thanks so much for having me. For this has been just a joy and I'm so honored to be Thank you for listening to the Long Term Podcast. It. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.